Um, this work was all derived from a project that I did at the National Centers for Environmental Information, which is the world's storehouse of climate data and one of the biggest research centers in the world. Um, other than that, in my professional career, I've focused on computational pipelines, and I no longer am at NCI. I'm actually bootstrapping a privacy-focused media hosting company named Hexi. Um, so since this talk was derived from work, um, I'm going to present it in reverse order so as to give a context for the work. And I'm going to start off presenting a caricature of scientific computing in general. And after that, I will move on to some of the properties that these systems have. Um, I'll segue into information flow models and Onyx platform and the work we did for it in order to leverage that and to bootstrap native code and non-invasively re-architect a system that is almost a black box at that point. Um, I will conclude with an overview of Onyx Native as a platform and take questions. So let's get started. So I'm going to present the human con context of scientific computing, because most people who work in industry don't really have the same methodology or the same environment. Um, of course, obviously, they're solving non-code problems. Ideally, you'd like to state that to be true for business, but it's not exactly the same thing, because developer culture and computing in the industry have long since focused on the actual methodology of how to code properly, how to make reproducible systems, and so forth. Scientists, of course, are worried about science. And it is not uncommon to have grad students who help you, and they're not really coders, necessarily. And there isn't, to date, yet a very sort of systematic approach to how to build these computing systems. So they vary widely, and they have lots of interesting problems. One of the interesting aspects that's a little bit different than a lot of business-oriented computing pipelines is the human time scale leads to a lot of collaboration and some certain level of kind of stability because the, the collaboration is done over long time scales. You know, science takes time. And in the course of doing so, there's a lot of sort of human stability in that because it's not always trading computer code necessarily. And when you do, this stuff moves pretty slowly. Um, there's also a high degree of specialized domain knowledge, and they don't necessarily have a great deal of development practices. In fact, one great story, I worked with a scientist who is the world's expert of a certain thing in the climate data realm. He was in his 80s, and he had legitimately never heard of source control before. He was very excited, and he was totally willing to learn, but this was a shock to him, you know, that one could actually leverage these tools to make his life easier. So that leads to a lot of problems because there's often little overlap between these deployment, maintenance, and authorship sort of roles within development of these kinds of computing systems. So I'm just going to jump to the bad and the ugly of scientific computing. I would hope everyone understands all of the good parts of it and what wonderful things it does for humanity. When you kind of have the situation, you end up writing systems organically over long periods of time and multiple people pitch in. That means it is typically unarchitected. You know, organic systems don't necessarily have an architectural bent. Um, in the climate data realm, particularly, you have a situation where, you know, the system I will introduce later that's actually kind of the reason that this came about was, is over, has been in production for over 15 years. Um, some of it really literally has modems to talk to devices, and it is a mess of all kinds of different things that other people have tried to wedge in there over time. And in fact, what goes into this product has changed over time as well. So you kind of get this situation where these systems tend to be polyglot, they're opaque, and poorly documented. That's really problematic when you're tasked with rehabilitating one, which is the situation that I found myself in when I was working at NCEI and is the origin of this project, um, which is the ASOS system. So the ASOS system, I'm going to kind of blaze through certain, the, some of these slides, because there's a lot of information that's sort of irrelevant um, in a very real sense. I wanted to put them in so that you could get a very concrete understanding of 
some of the types of complexity that is very common in lots of different computing systems, especially ones that actually kind of serve as de facto production systems. You know, there's a lot of variety in the scientific community and scientific computing. So in some sense, I'm not necessarily talking about like pure research code, but there is a lot of computing that is done now that has transcended that, and there's a lot of expectations that these things are run in sort of principled, modern ways. And it's very difficult when you've got a 15-year-old project to present those affordances without doing something I call code archaeology or a complete rewrite, where ostensibly you just chip out the worst parts, make sure it still produces the results you had before, and you call it a day. You know, leave, kick the can down the road for the next person, hopefully a decade from now. Um, so ACE, this system itself has been running for 15 years. It was on an AIX box that was finally going to be retired. I mean, the operating system had been past its end of life date by eight years. By the time they started saying, we have no choice, we have to rehabilitate this. But the complexity has been so daunting, and it is a system in production, so, you know, it's a very careful process, and the pros and cons of which are complete rewrite, expensive, time-consuming, and as we know, dubious outcomes sometimes, or some other approach. And so I, am try I tried to find another approach, and this is the system that started it. Um, so it, the ASOS system clearly has a lot of stuff going on. It actually takes measurement, takes measurement data from a variety of instrument platforms, usually via modem. Um, there's low-resolution, high-resolution data. There's multiple types of QC that go on in this process. So it's got a fair amount of complexity. So it's a three-stage workflow. And ironically, most of NCEI's systems and a lot of scientific computing systems have a similar kind of simplistic kind of single stage here, single stage there, for how the system's actually constructed. So there's this initial ingest stage, which does some level of automated QC. There's an actual manual QC process to vet these results before they go into the archive, and then there's some publishing step. So one of which is the automated weather observation system. They're at airports. They collect all this data. Another one is these, this whole other system called ASOS, which are actual an instrument platform that also collect all these data, and they're at locations typically near some of these other ones, and they have lots of high-resolution data. <laughs> they're all pulled in via various modem, you know, kind of techniques, and there's also ingest of all this other data that is then incorporated into this final core data set that a lot of other data sets in the building actually also depend on. So not only are you in, at least within the climate data realm, but I think this is typical of a lot of other scientific computing scenarios, you end up having, you know, not only problems changing the fundamental project itself, but you have to be very careful because there is a much larger system at play that has dependencies that are also opaque to you at the time. Um, this is including how many are up there? Six other data sets. Before it's finally done, there's levels of QC. And how do you go about trying to determine how bad is it, right? So when it's a polyglot system, and this system has actually got Java, C++, C, Fortran, and is wired together with Bash. So we're looking at just the Fortran kind of part of it here, and we tried to come up with a way to predict how long and make an estimation for, say, a total rewrite, for instance. But in a polyglot system, especially common in scientific computing realms, this is really hard to do because things like cyclomatic complexity don't necessarily translate all of the complexity across languages. You know, how do you compare the complexity of a Java project that has an object-oriented architecture with one that's purely functional or just Fortran, one program, Fortran? So all we could do ostensibly was kind of just do li lines of code. At least that is literally kind of comparable, but again, it, it has all these same problems. So 
I'm just pointing this out mainly to give you the scope of how many bits and pieces are actually in the system. Um, that's the initial ingest part, um, the publishing part. Here's the publishing phase. There's 12,605 lines of bash in the system. And it's all wired together like so. And actually, one of the interesting and most kind of challenging parts of the project initially was to ensure that there was actual documentation. So one of the problems that's endemic everywhere with documentation is that it's all kind of institutional knowledge. But it's a particularly bad when you are in a situation where ostensibly the person who wrote it might no longer have like worked there and you know, might not even be around anymore to ask questions from. So we took six months to produce this diagram. And ostensibly, if I had to give any advice, don't get started or promise anything until you force somebody to write down exactly what it does, especially when no one really does. The main person who created this diagram literally has been semi-retired for almost a decade, only to keep him there to fix this when something goes wrong. And that is not uncommon, which is kind of shocking if you, you know, hear all these great talks about how full automation and reliability engineering and works and all the rest of this sort of stuff. Those are things scientific computing have not even really heard of necessarily. And again, with this sharp division between you know, the people making it who are scientists and the people tasked with running it and ensuring that it does actually work, um, barely talking to each other, this reliability idea is really problematic. Um, I think some of the best models that I've heard of are the integrated ones. But that kind of assumes that your research code that's super interesting eventually actually has to be in production. And that's a whole other kind of organizational, in, um, organizational investment that's really difficult to sort of argue for when you're in the government. Um, so, there are all these on the left, you'll see all of these different pieces that ingest different data sets. Some of them are modems, some of them are from some other part of the building. Um, there's all of this logic in the middle, and you can see your standard three phases of the workflow from left to right. So you start off there, you move to the middle, some human is looking at the data, and then it gets through some massive chain and publishes. So, that system had some interesting properties that were kind of unexpected and were what we leveraged to build a solution that could non-invasively re-architect. And I'll talk about that part and what I mean specifically by that later. But a lot of this came out of the culture of research, where lots of these things don't change over time very much. For instance, the data collection and the data representation of a lot of this data has been, is pretty historically stable. I mean, the parts of the code that are the oldest use Kermit to pull these files off of modems, and the format of that data has not changed in 15 years. And um, in fact, you know, I kind of showed you slides quickly of all of these instrument platform networks that it's drawing data from, but they literally um, haven't changed much either. In fact, finally, I think next year, they're going to start to upgrade them so that they're networked. They're not going to change the data format, but they're going to make sure they're networked. And that project to upgrade these systems is expected to take almost a decade. So the timescales of how things change in this realm is actually kind of more on the human level, and that is pretty handy because how that happens to tend to work and is part of the organic growth process is that there are very stable intermediate file formats that are well described that haven't changed in any you know, period of time. Or if so, they've been meticulously changed and argued about the changing of it you know, for probably years before someone finally adopts it. And that kind of then rolls out into the scientific community. So that's very handy. And another thing that's very interesting too, because again, this was all done from a human point of view, there's kind of workflows all the way down. And I'll get a little bit more into detail with that in the latter half of the talk, but you end up having a system. Oh, the next slide, in fact. <laughs> so yeah, if you look back at the original the system diagram and all those blocks, you know, we have a high level three phase workflow. But inside one of those blocks is 
a bunch of little Fortran programs that consume a single input file with a well-described file format, some logic to decide what to do next, so forth and so on. So that is itself a workflow. Here's a nice diagram. And that is also very handy for the solution that I came up with. So I'm going to segue now to information flow models. Um, and I'm not going to give, it, give an actual definition, because that isn't really necessary. The interesting parts of it that are applicable from the general idea that you are passing data at every level of the system, you know, you're not necessarily using strong APIs with structure and semantics. You know, it's, it's data, and it's declarative kind of all the way down. That lets you do nice things that otherwise are really hard, which is to compose and create your own DSL and abstractions on top of them at any level of logical kind of organization of the system that you choose. So to go back here, here's a very low, lower level one, you know, the highest level one. And they're both theoretically describable by a workflow system. And if you had one that had an information flow model fundamentally, well, then that could all be declarative which would be a very clean, kind of general purpose way to describe these systems and potentially reason about them. So my goal at this project was to find a way to rehabilitate this code without really understanding it, um, <laughs> and in a way that would be shorter, cheaper, more reliable, and provide things that the re-architecture, like the re-engineering, code you know, kind of archival approach can't deliver, which is modern affordances of deployed systems, deployed computational systems that maybe could offer reliability engineering. And at the very least, great things that are still like wishful thinking in the scientific community, like centralized logging, very stu the stuff that we take for granted at this point in you know, industry. So, the approach that I took then was to say, OK, well, if everything can be described as a workflow system, it's already theoretically nicely decomposed between every program that's run, because inside that massive map are all of those individual Fortran programs. They're actual single things. You can run them in independently, and there isn't really any strong connection between them. Um, and then I wanted to leverage the information flow model to be able to try to make it declarative and do it in a unified way so that that same approach could be applied to any level of abstraction within the system. So for example, each individual task could have a nice little wrapper API that hopefully would be lightweight and not really ask much from the implementing um, developer that could take one piece and give it a consistent, uniform way to communicate with the larger system and allow it to have all these nice new affordances that were not present in the original system because they didn't think about adding them. So it turns out that there is such a workflow system that has a declarative model that takes actual data as a way to describe the system itself and its onyx. So the main difference, the main problem we encountered here, well, there were several, but the main problem that we had to address was that Onyx, well, at the time, was purely closure-based. So while you could certainly construct your own you know, data structures and use Onyx, the functions that you had to run ostensibly had to be closure functions. And it, within the government, as you could see, there were already many languages involved, and they're pretty conservative, so they were never going to let us write anything in Clojure. Um, and given the historical context, you kind of can't blame them. It's at least an understandable problem. You know, they've spent years sort of figuring out that Python's okay. You know, that now Python's okay. But 10 years from now, maybe nobody's going to use Python exactly. Or I'm sure there will people be using Python, but it's not the programming language du jour. And now they'd have a system that had another programming language bolted onto it. Um, that was something we wanted to avoid, and they weren't going to let us anyway. So the Onyx platform, for those who aren't really familiar with it, have a, describes its 
workflow as a data structure. Here's this graph of instructions that, if you can see, they kind of lay out a nice little graph of what pipes data to what. Um, and inside Onyx, everything is essentially a map. So you're being passed data structures between every part of it. The way you describe a job is a data structure. Um, everything at that point is declarative. So, for example, these tasks that we saw in the graph of the workflow are just another kind of data with annotation about what function gets run with what name. So there's an abstract kind of binding to the actual function that executes the code at runtime. And when you submit a job, again, you just construct one of these data structures, and then you pass it to the system and say, good luck with that. Um, the, other the other property that was really advantageous to us within the building of Onyx was that it can be easily deployed as a single instance job. Essentially, the, comp the competing kind of workflow systems tend to expect you to originally set up a cluster of some kind and has strong semantics with respect to some programming language about how you use it, how you invoke things, how functions are declared and all the rest of that that is not declarative. So that is a another investment that you'd have to ask the ops team to buy into in order to get this to work. So that it puts you in a difficult position unless you can make a legitimate case, which you can in Onyx's, is that you don't need a cluster to run this program. Um, it's, theore it's not theoretically Java. I mean, it does. it is just a jar, which worked as an argument at that point. And it fits our use case really well. So the main problems, though, we encountered and the work we did was to have to give it a Java API so that it really was Java, at least on the sort of implementation level of the code that we're going to be writing. And so we started writing Onyx Java, which basically, as a convention, has a fairly simple interface that ostensibly emulates Closure's interface and, and just produces the same, the correct data structures for, for the underlying system so that it's, there really isn't any kind of hard dependency between us and the platform itself. Um, we provided extra utilities so that you could make more direct use of the actual kind of closure native data structures that are pervasive in the Onyx platform. If you have used it before, some of the kind of single-use, non-plugin style kind of use to get data into the system are all done with these core async plugins, which of course ex really do require you to understand core async. And if you're trying to create a Java API, that's not really a great thing to ask someone to have to understand when they're not even going to be writing closure. So that provided some, we provided some tools to simplify that, and we added some extra affordances so that you could have a pure Java class in a closure based workflow in Onyx. And that sort of looks like this. Here's a simple example class that just passes data through. And we have set of interfaces and a base class that's an Onyx function that does all the bootstrapping within an Onyx workflow to ensure that this class is called at runtime properly. Um, here is an actual example of a catalog being created that has a, that same actual Java function. Um, essentially, there, it wasn't really that complicated. All you had to really do, all we really needed to do was be able to ensure that the right arguments were being passed around within Onyx so that by, and write a simple bootstrapper that could actually understand what to do with them and find the, you know, give you an instance of the Java class at runtime. Because of course, census closure, it's compiled down. They are actually Java classes at runtime. And the thing that was last and most important, essentially, to make this work on a legacy system that had a numerous amounts of Fortran code was to make sure that we could also, in a principled way, bootstrap native code for at runtime. And of course, Java being sort of around forever, and one of its initial survival selling points was that you could run C code 
Um, and C hasn't changed much, and it's still essentially the lingua franca of every computing system. I mean, almost anything can be compiled into C-compatible code. Um, that actually was pretty handy, and, and it's well documented and works great. So what we did here was just extended this class to give sort of you know, native bootstrapping support so that you could specify the library as part of your metadata, and you don't break the declarative model. And here's the standard, you know, JNI implementation of a very simple C function. So in Java, for those who have never used JNI, it's actually pretty clean. It's really nice. You just sort of add this keyword native. Java provides an extra tool that will generate this header. Um, they have a Baroque kind of way of expressing class hierarchies and assets, but ostensibly this is just straight C with you know, nice X turns and an implementation that's fairly straightforward. Right here is a disassoce function. I'm going ahead, getting out a string. There's a map that got passed in, and we're calling the code on the Java side to disassoce that value from the map and pass it back, pass the map through. Um, which fits the sort of standard Onyx model that every function that gets executed is a, gets a map segment and should a map one or more segments. Um, so that was great on the Java level, but it was important to kind of finesse some of the facts that map manipulation in native code when it is another level of abstraction up is really kind of tedious boilerplate, let's be honest. So we wanted to offer some affordances to make the use of this pretty easy, um, both in C and C++. The C++ kind of started off first and offers, so when, when a native code piece is loaded, the library is loaded, and the native context, the JVM runtime context for that library is squirreled away and kept available so that you can do nice things like use it transparent, like opaquely without even knowing you're operating in a JVM context, or get at the context directly if you need to do kind of more sophisticated Java-based kind of interop from within native code. So, and again, C and C++ aren't that different, so there's pretty, it was pretty easy to be able to offer both. Um, that includes a bunch of map affordances. Um, here's the standard set that we could come up with that didn't include things that were, had a dash in in them. So, because that's not as easy to, to get because of the way um, the actual underlying native closure classes had to be implemented, which kind of collide with how you do variable, very variable argument functions. Um, so you can't use ellipses and things that kind of you would typically do when you're kind of writing a C++ function that had a ver that was very variable argument list. Um, yeah, again, here's the C one for the native affordances. And since most of the programs were actually in Fortran, um, you, I'm showing you some Fortran-based solutions here, but the basic idea and the thing that made this, again, not so hard is that there really isn't a whole lot of difference between the library format of a Fortran module and the standard C library format. And that, of course, is not surprising considering the historical context that C came to try to fix some of Fortran's problems when Fortran was king. Um, and there are now nice standard ISO ways to do data structure conversion to, in a principled way for you somewhat automatically. And you can kind of see that this is actual Fortran here, and it's not that unfamiliar in a sense. You, you know, if anyone has done some C programming, you know, you have a subroutine, you declare it, so forth. And in this example here, loosely, you know, I'm showing how one could call back into the actual JVM runtime directly from Fortran without having to have a, any understanding of the runtime context of this call. 
when you're writing Fortran. And that was a very important aspect of trying to make it non-invasive. Because the last thing that we really wanted to do was to force them to learn some other Baroque library in order to, say, replace their file loading with our file loading, or add logging or event you know, emission from inside native code. Um, here is an act, uh, the implementation from the other way, top down. Um, again, same kind of difference because of the model being that you typically with Java, you have this, you know, we provided this sort of header in the C level, and you typically compile everything once and link it into one big library. So linkage between C and, and, for, and Fortran is, again, pretty straightforward because the libraries aren't that different. And you, here's an example of you calling some test function that lives inside a Fortran module that is all wrapped up and packaged nicely to get bootstrapped into the Conix runtime system. And so now that we have all these pieces, we could actually step out away from the fact that we use Onyx a little bit and, be, and start to abstract a way to describe our system in a way that's like less complex. It's not necessarily done in terms purely of Onyx. Instead, we can start to talk about it in terms of the problem domain. And that looked something like this. So now you can see that there are certain tasks, and you know, we've got a task block, and we can kind of specify what language and type, but all in our own terms, past constructor arguments, so forth. And kind of, again, it bears a strong resemblance to, to Onyx declar declarative data structures, but ostensibly it's got all of the extra metadata in a, put in in a way so that the person who's going to be tasked with, say, here's this system map, you know, can break it down into pieces. You know, you could do this all declaratively, store this, and if you had more sophistication, you could potentially generate these at runtime as well, just like you could in a normal Onyx -like execution environment. So some of the things that were really quite great and unexpected, well, of course, they weren't all unexpected per se, but some of them are aspirational, and it was very fulfilling to see them actually work out in practice, which is that we had a much quicker delivery time. Like our development cycle, was much faster than normal. And what I mean by normal is that a typical project, and this one in particular, was expected to take two to four years to do. You know, this isn't, here's a system, we'll rehabilitate it, we've got to get it off of the AX box today, but you have four years to do it, you know? Here, and no one would blink an eye, you know? You could just count in years, and they're like, okay. Because that's not unrealistic for, from a historical perspective, from how long some of these t systems really do take to rehabilitate. You know, especially if you are leery of touching anything you don't know, which is a good idea, and you know, are also kind of stuck in a deployment context that is you have very little control over. So your ability to use novel tools is very restricted. And again, the original authors might not have any have left anything behind. So, and in a system that's been in production for 15 years, you have to be really careful. Um, so years is normal. Um, and we were able to do it much less, and most of the time for this project actually took writing the bootstrapping part of Onyx itself. Um, so greatly reduced time to delivery was wonderful to see. And one thing that was unexpected was, of course, that the department and the organization wanted all kinds of other things bolted into it now that it seemed pretty easy to bolt stuff on, like, let's be able to tell net in. So that just becomes another sort of simple piece. A new block in the met of the actual top-level DSL says it's another task. You know, here's a service. And you can describe that declaratively and you know, mix and match these things in a much more sort of flexible way than prior to you know, prior when somebody would have to rewrite that in bash or some such, you know, kind of approach. And I know it seems unlikely, but it, but the just a jar kind of mantra really works. It's pretty interesting that at the point we got it to with a, a full-blown Java API, then Onyx as a system stopped being so sort of risky to them. Because even though it happens to be written in Clojure, it really is just a jar when you deploy it. 
And that argument worked pretty well because everybody uses Java. And finally, the repeatability of this approach is really high. Um, they've already started considering using this in other contexts with other systems because, as I pointed out much earlier, most of them really are these simple three-phase workflows with somebody in the middle, some stuff in the beginning, some stuff at the end. And yes, inside all of there is lots of little programs and lots of complexity, but again, that complexity tends to be little programs with some logic to decide what program to call next, handing the file all the, like one off all the way down the chain. So there really was a high degree of repeatability within this particular problem domain that was good to see. So I'm going to make some bold claims here, which, first of all, I think that this approach is especially well suited to scientific computing systems in general, because most of them really do have the same stereotyped human scale kind of growth. And they, you know, scientists tend not to, you know, because they're less focused on deployment concerns and maintenance concerns and development concerns in general, they've been focused on communicating results over spans of years. Um, you know, whatever programs they generate tend to, you know, kind of live on and have a life of their own and people tinker with them, but eventually they kind of settle down to be the workhorses of that part of the scientific process. You know, a lot of these file formats and, you know, the libraries they use to calculate a Julian date, like, those haven't changed in over a decade, and they're not going to anytime soon either, hopefully, you know, because they work, and they're right. And uh, so correctness of results tends to be what people are concerned about, and, you know, they're not in a rush, so they tend to have a very slow change cycle, and they also tend to end up, therefore, very well decomposed in a very similar way to this system. In fact, most of the ones that I looked at kind of had these exact properties, which leads me to my like, last bold claim, um, which is that this approach really, I think, is very well suited in general to legacy systems, which have the same really small set of properties, one of which is that it has these human scale stability to a lot of its internals, and the other one that you know somebody could theoretically figure out the map of the system to be able to describe these workflows in the first place. But I would argue that the first one is, prob is true generally, as I kind of pointed out, because of the nature of the environment in which these systems were developed. But secondly, they tend to also have the second property because of, oh, because they just, wait, what? sorry. Yeah, they, they tend to have both properties, which is that they're nicely decomposed as well. You know, once you get to the human timescale problem, you know, you have these stable file formats and this stable kind of communication, and they tend to be very piecemeal because of the organic growth over time. So most legacy systems kind of share the same properties. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, and I wanted to also thank my coworker on this project, who Ryan Berkheimer, who helped develop some of the Omnix Java stuff and inherited this project. So some of the you know, origins of the claims I've made, you know, were because he actually inherited kind of taking over the project officially, and he actually developed the DSL independently of me. So it was a really good test of whether or not, you know, kind of this approach really could ease some of the pain of transition when the original author left, um, which worked out really well, and he did a great job. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, he asked, how would you evangelize such an approach in other scientific communities? And I mean, I think that the simplicity and the human kind of scale, you know, aspects of it make the strongest argument at the end of the day. You know, they do want everything that modern systems offer. And it's not like they're entirely ignorant of those, you know, properties, but again, because of being, you know, conservative with respect to rebuilding, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not sure there is another alternative. And so I think that, you know, when you highlight the, na the typical nature of these systems and then point out how they could reason about them, even if they didn't understand the details, 
by this declarative method. You know, that, that was really a big selling point of the system itself. And the fact that it really does, you know, kind of boil down to a deployment strategy that they understand. And that's not, in and, in and of itself, not controversial, was also a, a big win. Yes, yes. So the question was, like, how does dependency sort of, you know, lay out work? And there, the workflow itself can, you know, basically force it to sort of end up being linear with some of the affordances that are built in. So you don't necessarily have to have true parallelizability within an Onyx workflow if you, unless, if you don't want to. Um, and in that case, that was a pretty critical sort of thing to be able to work with in a system that had a human intervention. I mean, it, in that sense, it's not, it doesn't resemble traditional kind of computational workflow systems running in production that are fully automated. You know, there really could be a weak gap between, you know, the initial ingest and someone finally doing the human QA before it could go into ar the archive. Yes, both of these are open source projects. So Onyx Java is living right now as part of the Onyx platform. And Onyx, or J Onyx Native, oh, I didn't put the link up. Um, yes, they're, they're both online. I can get you the link um, to Onyx Native after the talk. That is a great question. So you can more or less find a way to fake running Bash as a process and wedge it in there, which doesn't give you all of the nice affordances, mind you, but at least is conceptually and principled with this approach. And one of the other facets of this approach that really pays off that to be able to address stuff like that is that because now every little logical action task within this system is sort of nicely compartmentalized, that lets you do targeted re-engineering. So yeah, the, one of the, ta the larger long-term tasks was to rewrite all the bash and you know, in, you know, use this new nice new API. But if you couldn't, you could still use, you could still execute the bash and more or less make this work properly within the workflow. Sure. Yeah, um, well, my experience was really pleasant, but I'm incredibly biased, so um, let me put it that way. But yeah, there are really good example packages, and you know, the nicest thing that made it really easy to kind of come up to speed was the fact that in reality, you don't have to know closure at all to sort of think logically and reason about how to build a workflow and what to make it look like. And, what dependencies are and so forth. And at the end of the day, um, like this catalog shows, you know, ostensibly, at least in the pure closure case and of, you know, in the Onyx Java slash native case, you know, your responsibility at the end after sort of describing this data structure is to write that single function that gets executed at runtime, which actually makes it pretty easy to reason about. And there are nice examples to show you how this works out. In fact, I'm actually copying one of the simple um, Onyx tutorial code projects that has, you know, a fairly simple workflow, but... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. 
Oh, well, all, all of that was added after the fact. You know, we, there was the raw API that just added the affordances to Onyx itself. And then once we had that, we built a DSL with our own kind of task API that added all these extra affordances that fit into the organization, you know, that we were actually working with. Um, did that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? No, let's, let's, let's take it offline. Thank okay. You. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.